I'm Marty Stauffer. Once, when the West was wilder, millions of Mustangs ran free across the land. Some became the prized possessions of the native people, who called them sacred dogs. Descendants of those resilient Indian ponies live on among the isolated canyons and rugged mountains of southern Montana. Living in highly organized and complex family groups, a powerful stallion and his graceful mares pass on survival traits to their lively colts. Join me as I trace the tragedies and triumphs of one very special wild horse family in Year of the Mustang. It's late winter in the ancient heart of Crow Indian country. A wild horse stallion named Raven quenches his thirst on a remnant of last week's snowstorm that reached down even into these desert foothills. Close by, his buckskin mare tends their newborn foal. The buckskin's daughter, a two-year-old Palomino, sired by another stallion, follows them. Raven's other mare is gray, a color called Gruya. Their yearling son is Little Raven. We name the foal Diamond for the prominent star on his forehead. His father, Raven, is their band leader. It's his job to defend the family against any threat. At just two days old, Diamond learns how wild horses react to danger. On an early morning in mid-March in southern Montana, they race away. Far away from Raven's home, wild horse bands in Nevada are running in a race they will not win against an aerial enemy nature never prepared them to face. A roundup is in progress. A Judas horse is released just ahead of the fleeing wild horses. Their domestic cousin has been trained to head for the horse trap. Wild ones follow. All horses are highly social creatures. Today, their love of companionship will prove to be their undoing. Wild horses are also called mustangs, an English version of the Spanish word mustenos, meaning wild ones or strays. Because Mustangs live mostly on government land, they are under the care of the Bureau of Land Management, known as the BLM. The BLM is in charge of managing wild horses and removing excess animals, sometimes bending to the will of cattle and sheep ranchers, 
who want these lands exclusively for their livestock. Many of the older horses will be released within 24 hours, but most young animals will be trucked to Reno and put up for adoption as part of the BLM's Wild Horse and Burro Adoption Program. The stress of a roundup seems unthinkable on this peaceful late spring day in the Arrowhead Mountains. The Palomino mare has given birth to a striking orange colt. While she and the rest of the mares lead the way to the high country, Raven stays in back as rear guard. Though only a few days old, the orange colt easily keeps up with his mother. Ears laid back, Raven snakes the band along. Firstborn foal, Diamond, has a brother born just days after him. He's a gruya like his mother. He and Diamond are seldom far apart. Their little brother never strays more than a few feet from his protective mother. The Palomino signals trouble. A bachelor stallion out trying to capture mares encounters Raven's band. The forceful six-year-old band leader urges his family away from the attacker. Rich grazing atop the mountain is a summer magnet for many wild horse families. Raven's band arrives at one of the mountain's clear, spring-fed water holes. Other bands, like Geronimo's, also arrive. But Raven's family group is a higher ranking one by virtue of its size and cohesiveness, plus the strength of its leader. Geronimo is a low ranking band stallion, so he cautiously waits his turn. Raven's yearling, Little Raven, has the advantage of learning from one of the most dominant stallions on the mountain. A trip to the waterhole is often followed by a dust bath. Dirt clings to the buckskin's damp coat, protecting her from biting insects. Nearby, Raven asserts his dominance over a pair of younger bachelor stallions. Another powerful band is arriving at the waterhole. This one is even bigger than Raven's and is led by an experienced sorrel stallion named Flash. The crafty older horse lets his son help him manage the large herd. Here at the waterhole, social dramas are often played out. Today is no exception. When a bay bachelor gets too close, both Flash and his lieutenant's son 
surround the intruder. Eventually, Flash takes on the persistent bachelor all by himself. The skirmish seems to set off a chain reaction. Full of hormonal energy, bachelors begin play fighting, honing skills they will need to win and keep mares. June passes colorfully into July. The horses are putting on weight. They spend about half their time grazing on subalpine grasses and forbs. Diamond is shedding his baby coat and turning into a blue roan. His little brother is still the color of an arrowhead sunrise. Could Raven and the other Mustangs of the Arrowheads be the ancestors of the Crow Indian ponies that once roamed nearby? The bones of this Mustang mare are clues in an ongoing mystery. While most domestic horses have six lumbar vertebrae, these horses have only five, or a fifth fused to a sixth suggesting they are of Spanish descent. One Ute Indian tale tells of a band encamped at the base of the Spanish peaks in southern Colorado. In the distance, they saw a man in a shiny shirt coming toward their camp. He had a white beard and he was riding on the back of what the Utes called a big dog. He gave the Utes the gift of horses. The man in the shiny shirt was no doubt a Spanish conquistador who encountered the Indians sometime in the 1600s. The native people used their gift wisely quickly transforming themselves into a dynamic and mobile horse culture. All had a passion for racing. Some had special skills at breeding horses. The Nez Perce believed that painting the hindquarters of a pregnant mare would help her produce a spotted foal. They named their flashy horses Appaloosas for their Palouse Valley home. The hardy Appaloosas were crucial to the success of the Lewis and Clark expedition in the early 1800s. Few tribes confined their horses. Instead, they used young boys to guard the herds as training for manhood. Over the years, literally thousands of horses wandered off and grew into the great herds of the grasslands. By the 1820s, there were as many as three million wild horses in North America. They shared the prairies with 60 million bison and herds of elegant pronghorn, the fastest of our land mammals. The horse may have died out 10,000 years ago in North America due to a combination of overhunting for food and climatic change. But once they returned, they flourished on the broad prairies. Texas alone had one million of these remarkably tough animals.
Within 15 minutes of birth, a wild horse foal must be on its feet, nearly ready to follow its family band to a water hole many miles away. The Mustangs seem tailor-made for the wind-swept grasslands. On flying hooves, they could almost outrun the wind. The heyday of Indians and their horses was short. Mustangs, Native Americans, and bison all shared the same fate. Westward expansion made all nearly extinct. Yet, the romantic image lingers on. Like the Indian, the wild horse has been relegated to remote and often inhospitable places. But the very ruggedness of the Bighorn Canyon, a natural barrier to wagon trains and railroads, may have been the salvation of the descendants of the Crow Indian ponies. Here they found an isolated sanctuary, which they share with Bighorn sheep. It's late summer. Raven's Band is flourishing. Diamond and his Gruya brother are constant companions. Their little brother has turned into a strawberry roan. Native Americans would surely have prized Raven's buckskin mare. They called her color claybank because her coat matches the color of the soil along the banks of many nearby rivers. Only the wife of the chief would have been allowed to ride her. When Raven's band leaves the water hole, the strawberry roan colt is left behind. He calls for his mother, who answers from the forest. are soon reunited on the summer meadows atop the arrowheads. This will be one of the last times they are all together. Summer is coming to an end. The day starts with the distant drone of a spotter plane. A roundup is about to begin. A team of wranglers, all employees of the Bureau of Land Management, prepare to scale the summit of the arrowheads. Over the course of two and a half weeks, they invade the peaceful fall meadows looking for wild horses and trying to capture any Mustang they can find. Unlike the professional roundup crew in Nevada, the government wranglers dragnet the mountain, driving terrified wild horses down miles of rough terrain to permanent corrals 4,000 feet below the alpine meadows at the top. Their careless techniques result in the breakup of band stallions and their mares. 
Foals are driven in without their mothers, and mares are captured, leaving their foals to wander the high country alone. Raven's band is captured. Unlike every other band, however, they are kept together at our request. We soon discover that Raven's youngest, the Strawberry Roan Colt, is missing. The Wranglers claim the Colt ran away from its mother, a curious and unbelievable story from what we know of horse behavior. but other bands have missing family members too. And so we hold out hope the colt can be found. We convince the BLM to release the Palomino mare so she can look for her lost colt. Over the next month, we share in her search. Raven's band is shrinking, first the colt and now its mother. Frustrated, the beautiful black is ready to do battle. He lashes out at any horse venturing near his prison walls. When our crew returns in early October, the BLM has disappeared. The horses have empty hay bunks, are eating their own feces, and nibbling on discarded pieces of twine. We pitch hay to the hungry animals and are saddened by their listless behavior. In captivity, they seem diminished, even shabby. Once the BLM cowboys do return, we leave again to search for the missing strawberry roan colt. Within the hour, the cowboys begin heading and healing, a roping technique identical to these scenes filmed in years past with the same government wranglers. A Wild West show for the BLM becomes a nightmare for the wild horses. Flash's chestnut mare is torn apart, shot, like then dumped today. within a hundred feet of the corrals. Her legs aren't broken here. Concerned wild horse supporters find her body decaying in the greasewood. And I'll bet they split her apart probably right there. Right here is what's, yeah, mm -hmm. look at there. There's yep, her. There's broken yep. all and busted her hip. The grisliest discovery of all, another missing horse is found. This time, it is Raven's Gruya Colt, Diamond's brother. We may never be sure why he died so suddenly. We're told he had diarrhea, but are denied the opportunity of an autopsy. He is thrown out with the garbage in a nearby county landfill.
Back at the corrals, Raven is driven into a chute where a local vet draws blood. The goal, to determine through DNA testing how Spanish he and his band might be. Only diamond remains of this year's foals. After three long weeks in captivity, what is left of Raven's band is released. It's a cruel irony that they were rounded up when the BLM never intended to adopt any of them out. By mid-October, winter has dusted the mountaintops, and Raven is still without his Palomino mare. His steadfast little buckskin mare and Diamond are close by. We find the Palomino high on the mountain, near a newborn filly, the daughter of Flash, and his only remaining mare. The Palomino, who is still without the strawberry roan foal, has gravitated to the only newborn on the mountain. But October is no time to be born here in the Arrowheads. The coming winter will quickly separate the weak from the strong. Next time, we continue the story of this very special wild horse family. A magnificent new colt will grace Raven's band, a colt we name Cloud. Danger abounds for Cloud and his sisters atop the wild Arrowhead Mountains, once the sacred heart of Crow Indian Country. Come along and join us as the powerful Black Stallion faces his toughest challenge when Year of the Mustang continues. I'm Marty Stauffer. Until next time, enjoy our wild America.